So doing this direct training with teams, let's go back to these essential functions. And I'm really curious what everyone thinks of this, because this is kind of new work for us. I think a lot of people see the stages, drivers, improvement cycles piece with our frameworks, but really getting into the teams has been a new area that we're very focused on as a leverage point for scale. So you can develop a good team structure that would mean that you, rep you have a team that represents the full system, that it provides an accountable structure, that there is some sort of memorandum of understanding of what the team is responsible for, what it's not responsible for, and that there are linked communication protocols in place because many of the initiatives we work with on a state or national level are massive initiatives. So it's putting in place those connections between teams so that information is effectively fed up and down the system. If they have intervention fluency, they should be able to do a good job around assessing fit, demonstrating fluency in the strategy, and doing further operationalizing of the intervention when needed, going back to those usable intervention criteria. We work with teams to understand when greater definition needs to be done with the model. Knowing and applying implementation, so they should understand infrastructure, so that would be for us the driver's piece, conducting stage appropriate work, and using appropriate leadership strategies. Knowing and applying improvement cycles, they should be able to institutionalize feedback loops, use data for decision making, functionally engage leaders, and systems change. Understand systems components, build cross-sector collaboration. If these things are in place, what would we expect as a result of this? If we do this work with teams, what do we expect would happen? Well, if we have good team structures, they should be able to make decisions or access decision makers. Poor structures won't allow decisions to be made because you can't make them on the team or you don't have access to those who can. If you have intervention fluency, you can make decisions around operationalizing or adapting model components and you can promote implementation of the core or mandatory, mandatory components of the model. If you understand implementation, you can make good stage-based decisions and start to build your infrastructure. If you know improvement cycles, you can use data for problem solving. So you're not just collecting data, you're using it for action planning. If you are good at doing systems work, you should be able to improve access, reach, or scale, and you should be able to make connections across service sectors and influence decision making in that way. So this is what we look for with teams. We look to see whether these results are happening. This is how we start to track our work. Are we doing enough in this jurisdiction we're working in? Can we measure results of team process? So we have a measure we're working on related to this, which I'm happy to share with people via email if you'd like. So now I just want to, walk, how am I on time? Oh my gosh, all right, sorry. So this is the Catawba County Child Wellbeing Project. I want to give an example of how we built team capacity in this county and what the results look like at this point. So the Catawba County Child Wellbeing Project, briefly, was funded by a private foundation to develop, install, improve a post-care service system for children exiting foster care to any permanent placement. So they can be reunified, guardianship, adoption. Many, many service models were looked at as part of this post-care service system. The foundation, the Duke Endowment, was very committed to use of evidence-based models and only one evidence-based models used. After we looked at things like need, fit, level of evidence, resources, capacity, some evidence-based models were chosen. Some evidence-informed models were chosen, and some models were developed. And the foundation stuck with us, so that's what makes this kind of an interesting case study to look at. <clears throat> so 
remember I said with implementation teams, the size and structure varies depending on the scope. Composition and function of teams will change over time. The only thing you want, though, is an accountable structure needs to remain at every stage to avoid pitfalls of implementation. This is what the structure started out as in Catawba County. We had teams that were broken out by service area. We had a cross services team that linked all those services together at kind of a meta level. And there was a design team where decision makers sat. Each team had a memorandum of understanding and each team had a communication protocol that linked them to other teams. And they were held accountable for sharing information up and down and across their system. We actively built their capacity. So we worked with each team to develop model fluency, to make good choices, to install the infrastructure, to enact systems improvements, and to use data. So remind, here are the drivers. And I'm just going to walk through an example of how the drivers were used at each stage of implementation for Catawba County. So during the exploration stage, teams asked themselves, how are we planning for? So they were thinking about the implementation infrastructure from the very beginning. Do we have a workforce to pull from for this intervention? Is training feasible? Is it sustainable? Are our data systems and technology where they need to be? During installation, teams asked, how are we now developing or installing each driver? So now it's not that we're planning for, now we are actually selecting, training, developing our coaching plans, getting our data systems up and running. Remember, installation, if you build it, they will come, but you have to build it first. The teams built, built the infrastructure. During initial implementation, the teams asked, how are we supporting or problem solving? So they looked at data across a wide range. I'm narrowing this talk to particularly the drivers. When we weren't having fidelity scores that we wanted, they started to say, is this a training problem? Is this a coaching problem? Is this a management problem? So looking through, how are we supporting and problem solving each of the best practices related to those drivers of implementation? And during full implementation, they asked, how can we improve and sustain? So this was their framework to connect the drivers to each stage. I'm going to talk about initial implementation. So remember, during initial implementation, they asked about supporting or problem solving. So we have an assessment of each of those drivers, selection, training, coaching, performance assessment, decision support data systems, management, and systems work. And that assessment is designed to go deeper into the drivers. So there's indicators for each of the drivers that are based on best practices. And we assess the extent to which each of those drivers is in place, partially in place, or not in place. So we work with the teams to assess whether they're meeting best practices for selection, whether they're meeting best practices for training, whether they're meeting best practices for systems interventions. So we do an explicit assessment of the implementation infrastructure so for us, this was administered in the Public Child Welfare Agency by the teams. We did the assessment at three months after initial implementation, and then again at follow-up assessments one and two years later. I wouldn't do it this way now, I would have done it six months apart. But this project had a research study attached to it, and we were not the researchers. We were the implementation support folks. So I just did this because I wanted to. Um, but uh, I, I would have done this a little bit differently. We facilitated sessions with each of the implementation teams to develop consensus scores for each of the drivers. So remember we said, are they in place, partially in place, or not in place? The teams, each team member had to agree on that score. So this was an active, facilitated process rather than uh, an objective kind of, you know, they go and they fill this out on their own. 
I want to give a couple examples because it's interesting. One of the, um, remember I said there's a lot of interventions for this project. One of them was called the Success Coach, which was an intensive home visiting clinical case management model that they developed. They developed all the usable intervention criteria for it. It is not an off-the-shelf evidence-based model. It was homegrown. It took about 15 months to develop the initial criteria for it. So it's an interesting one to look at because the teams then, if they had to develop the usable intervention criteria, what else did they need to develop? All the implementation supports. There was no guidance on selection. There was no training manual. There was no coaching manual. There was no fidelity criteria, right? They had to develop all that as well. If you look at three months in, if you think about partially in place, or I'll start with not in place, you're given a zero. Partially in place is a one. In place is a two. We developed composite scores for each of the drivers based on their responses. You can see that the average composite score in the first few months of the success coach model is pretty low. It's a one. It means that everything's basically partially in place. We have this hypothesis, my colleague and I, Dean Fix and I know some of you know, that we think a 1.5 was what we, we thought we might need to see to get good fidelity. We don't know that. That was a, a best guess. So we have 1.1. 18% of the cases, very low sample size, were receiving the intervention with fidelity at this time. The implementation team took that data, took their fidelity data, took any other kind of data they could get their hands on, and they said, where are the challenges here? And they were able to strengthen their infrastructure. They improved coaching. They looked at their administrative supports. They looked at stakeholder issues in the system, so referral pathways, all those things. You see that they improved their infrastructure scores on that driver's piece and increase their fidelity a year or two years in, and also about bigger sample sizes. There's so many caveats to this that by the time I'll tell you, because remember, I wasn't the researcher. This was me going in and doing something I thought was really fun. So I can tell you what the caveats are, and I'll tell you that after I run through, because I'm out of time, I just want to finish this one piece. The other two examples are also fascinating because they're evidence-based models. So here, the teams weren't developing the models. They selected models that already existed. So one is the Strengthening Families um, Parenting Program, and one was Parent-Child Interaction Therapy. The Strengthening Families model, they did not work with them to be their evaluators. So they, all, they came in and they did two days of training, and that's it. Now, most jurisdictions, if they receive that training, would think they were then ready to go. But we created savvy consumers who knew they weren't ready to go after two days of training. And we worked really hard to say, well, what about all those other drivers? Coaching, fidelity assessments. The model developer was not installing those drivers for them. They installed one driver training. So we worked with a team to then uh, collaborate with an intermediary organization in North Carolina, Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina who worked with them very closely on coaching and fidelity and other pieces, other aspects of the drivers, before they launched. So we did a very early qualitative assessment of the drivers and knew it doesn't matter that we have a developer. Coming in and training, we can't, we can't move forward until we fill these other gaps. Parent-child interaction therapy was totally different. They're funded by Duke University to have a learning collaborative. They install all of the drivers. There are nine months to be rostered as a therapist. They require management to be at the table. They address systems issues. They do it all, but they leave. So there the question was, can we sustain the infrastructure and sustain fidelity when they exit? So those are the two things that we're curious about there. You can see with strengthening families, we were able to install those other drivers ourselves before they launched. Good driver scores, good fidelity. 
PCIT, we did not install those initial drivers. PCIT installed them for us. Good driver scores, good fidelity. But a year later, when they pulled out, we were able to maintain that fidelity. So we took over coaching. We took over fidelity assessments. I say we because I'm so wedded to this project. I don't work there, but. Again, a million caveats, the lowest sample sizes, and it's just, you know, Bruce may talk about that. But um, looks like families have been stabilized through prevented reentry of children into out-of-home placement. So some of the big goals so far, strengthening families did what it should do, which is improve parenting knowledge and skill. PCIT did what it should do, reduce externalizing behaviors in children. So we have some early results that show that we have positive outcomes for children because we have high fidelity use of the innovation, because we had local implementation teams that were able to make sense of evidence and make sense of data. And they were able to do that because we actively built their, built their capacity using the active implementation frameworks and really teasing out the competencies that are needed for teams to be successful. So that's that. I'm over by like 10 minutes. I'm sorry.